Hi, I'm Joe Barbetta. I'm going to melt down my Volkswagen Jetta to make a C-clamp. This is the aluminum intake manifold that I will start with. I'll start the process by cutting up the intake manifold on my bandsaw. <laughs> So this is the furnace that I'm going to use. So this I actually created in uh, 10th grade. I started experimenting with furnaces just made out of plaster of Paris. Uh, this is the top made out of plaster of Paris, but dries out very quickly and it starts cracking. So later I learned that by adding a layer of fire clay that uh, it's less likely to crack, but it still does. That helps uh, protect the plaster of Paris. And you can see that there's a, a nichrome coil inside the furnace. So at first, you know, I started firing the furnace electrically, but then later I drilled a hole and I was able to fire the furnace with propane. I'd be able to get a lot more uh, power going into the furnace. I could melt, uh, my aluminum more quickly. For crucibles, this isn't the best thing to do, but at the time I would take uh, an empty propane cylinder, 14 ounce propane cylinder, and I'd cut it in half. And the outside starts to flake off. Uh, at that point I devised a, a coating, and you can see this holds a, a few pounds of aluminum, uh, there's aluminum in it, uh, so I last used this uh, probably like 37, 38 years ago, uh, and perhaps uh, I ran out of propane and and the melt just ended up in the in the crucible. This is one of the castings that I created back then. Uh, it, it came out pretty well. You could see that there are some you know, problems with the casting, you know, but pretty good for 10th grade. And I would make my patterns just out of wood and with some uh, caulking, you know, for the fillets. And then I would coat it with shellac. This is the design in Fusion 360. And I have to admit that uh, I already cast this part and uh, it wasn't until later that I noticed I actually spelled Volkswagen wrong. It should be VW and not WV. But, uh, so here's the, uh, the C-clamp. And it's split into two halves. So you can see the top part here and the bottom part. And that's the split that there'll be between the top, between the top uh, drag and the bottom cope. And that's also called the parting line. We can see that there's also a cone, a hollow cone that's created for the sprue. That's where the aluminum is poured in. And also the riser. That's where aluminum can go back to have an, enough pressure to ensure that the pattern is fully full of aluminum, especially as it's cooling. And uh, one method that I employ is I actually make a separate body, which I call the sprue bottom, and that's made for the cone to fit in nicely. And for different designs, I can position and make copies of that as necessary uh, around the mold. Another thing is that there's a good use of draft angles. So if I zoom in on different parts of the mold, you could see that I maintained angles here, so there are no fully vertical faces. And this allows the uh, pattern to be removed from the sand easily. So at this point we have our pattern uh, 3D printed, and it consists of the top and the bottom and the sprue and the riser cones. 
So we'll first put this in the drag and start packing or casting sand around it. So here you can see we took the drag, which is the bottom of the flask, and we turned it upside down. And the bottom of our pattern is at the bottom surface, which is actually the parting line. So at first, we're going to use some uh, parting powder. So this is just uh, powder for, uh, for lifting and for rock climbing. Uh, traditionally, uh, talc has been used, uh, but now it's difficult to buy talc because now baby powder is uh, cornstarch. So here I have uh, some of the parting powder in, uh, in a sock, and I'm just going to put a little bit on top of the pattern, and this will help prevent the uh, sand from sticking to it too much. Okay, and there's a nice cloud of parting dust. Okay, so this is what the uh, sand looks like. It's actually an, an oil-based sand. And first I'm going to put it in this sifter here. Okay, so this will just help remove some of the clumps. This sand is still relatively new, so it does have a lot of oil in it. And then you could start scooping some in also. So try not to move the pattern from the center. And then when you have, you know, your first layer, you could then use your ramming tool to ram down this first layer around the pattern. And it's important to also ram tightly around the perimeter. And that will help prevent the sand from falling out of the open drag. <laughs> to get into the corners, you could also use the angled part of your rammer. This rammer was just made from PVC tubing with uh, 3D printed parts at the end. And then when you feel that it's uh, full, you can then level the top off with any straight edge. So here I'm using a ruler, a metal ruler. Okay. So now I'm going to turn this over, okay, <laughs> and hope it doesn't fall out. <laughs> okay, so there is the bottom that is in the drag. Okay. 
Now, one thing I do in, in my patterns, whether they're 3D printed or not, I create uh, holes that will accommodate alignment pins. So I have two pins that I actually uh, cut from a piece of uh, wire hanger. So we're about 3 30 seconds of an inch in diameter. And I'm going to push them in their holes. And similarly, there are holes in the top part of the pattern. Okay, so now the pattern there. So this, this, help, this helps uh, ensure registration between the top and the bottom. I'm also going to add my sprue and riser. And you want to be careful you know, to make sure there's no sand on it, you don't want to push it in too hard because later you're going to have to pull it out. So I just place it in with just a little bit of friction. Again, clean the ends to make sure there's no sand there. That'll prevent them from being pulled apart later on. Okay. And a lot of times at this step, you'll see uh, more parting powder added to this whole surface here and that prevents the sand from the cope sticking to that in the drag. Okay. One technique that, that I started using is to actually, you know, print out a picture of the pattern or trace it on a piece of paper and then, you know, roughly cut out around the object and this will help serve as our as our parting line so I'm going to put that on there I'm still going to add parting compound but again the idea of this is that you don't use a, a lot of parting uh, powder and you don't get your sand over time saturated with all this parting powder. And also the parting powder over the pattern itself helps to prevent the sand from sticking to it. Okay. Now, the next step is to put the cope, the top part, on top here. And to insert two alignment pins. That will keep the cope registered to the drag. Okay. You can also close these uh, clamps that I added. You don't always see them on a cope and drag. Sometimes people just use uh, C clamps, but I made the deluxe model. <coughs> I'm in a cloud of parting dust. Okay, so now I'm going to start uh, adding sand into the cope. And you do want to be careful, we'll be packing sand around the, the sprue and the riser. So the sifter is not the best right now. <laughs> but you want to be sure when you do that, that you don't uh, displace the sprue or the riser that much. 
Now, I know a lot of people don't even, uh, you know, <clears throat> create a special pattern for their sprue or riser. And later, you know, just cut it out with the tube. So that, that's always an option. So the first layer I'm going to put carefully. Again, we do have pins registering the top of the pattern to the bottom, so that shouldn't shift. But, you know, I'm always still careful with this, especially this first layer. Now this sand is in pretty good shape, it's relatively new, but note that as sand gets older there's actually something called a mulling operation. And that's a, a process where the sand is mixed very well, perhaps with even some more uh, oil added, just to make sure that there are no lumps and that all the sand particles are actually, you know, properly coated inadequately coated with oil. Sometimes I also use a piece of wood as a rammer just to get into corners. Just remember not to uh, hit your sprue and riser because then it'll, it'll be very difficult, very difficult to remove them. Like we did before, we could take out the ruler again, you know, to get rid of excess, excess sand. Another thing that's good to do is to create some vent holes. So this is a piece of a uh, wire hanger that I sharpened. And because the sand does have some porosity because you do have to let uh, the air escape when the aluminum is pouring into the mold. And also you have some of the uh, oil that is vaporizing as well. So to help that process, we just put in a lot of vent holes with this wire. You know, it's not critical where they are. Sometimes you could even do without them, but it does help with releasing any trapped gases or fumes. At this point, we can remove our sprue and riser. So I'll first tap them a little bit. And then do some wiggling and turning. Okay. 
and then we could round out the area. Okay, note some sand will fall in, but uh, that's going to be blown out later on. Sometimes what people will do, they'll create a pouring basin. So they'll take a little sand out right near the sprue. with an entryway into the sprue. And then sometimes you could pour the aluminum into this area and it'll make its way into the sprue and that, you know, helps prevent some, you know, turbulence down at the bottom of the sprue. Turbulence that, you know, will dislodge some, uh, you know, some sand. Okay, now this is the point where we have to open up uh, the flask. So we're going to take the cope off. Okay? Now this is in some ways a moment of truth because what could go wrong is if uh, the cope isn't packed well enough, uh, the sand could fall out. Uh, if you don't have good parting between the sand and the drag and the cope, that'll stick, that'll help prevent some sand to fall out. So, you know, I get very nervous at this step. And uh, if things go bad, I will try not to say a lot of bad words. So I'm going to open up my clams carefully. Going to take out my alignment pins. I'm going to clean out an area where I'll be able to put the cope. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so pretty good. Can remove our temporary parting line paper. That seemed to work pretty well. If there is any sand dislodged, you know, you can just you know, push it back into place, you know, with your fingers. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm going to remove the top part of the pattern. Oh, and actually, very nice, the bottom came out too. So here you could see, you know, where we have, uh, you know, our depression in the mold for the bottom. And the top, we have a similar uh, depression. Okay. And now it's time to close up the mold again. Again, very careful so no sand falls out. the alignment pins back. I always have extra ones in case I lose one. <laughs> and then close up the latches again. Okay, so we are ready to bring this outside and pour our aluminum. 
So this is the moment we've been waiting for where I'm going to melt and pour the aluminum. I'll be using a crucible that I made out of a half of a propane cylinder. It's the type I used to make when I was young. And this is somewhat dangerous. You don't want to try this at home. I happen to be in an industrial park where we can do dangerous things like this. So first I'm going to ignite the furnace. So this is a, a copper tube here. It goes to a blower. Let me turn on the propane. Crucible is empty. I'm just going to place it in the furnace here. Okay, note there's no aluminum in here. The furnace is still, you know, pretty cool. We're not anywhere near melting temperature. So you could see that we are getting, you know, we're on the melting point of aluminum, 660 degrees Celsius. Now I showed the infrared pyrometer, but I also have this thermocouple uh, meter. And uh, the good thing about using a thermocouple is you don't have to worry about emissivity, because with the thermal readout, with the thermal uh, pyrometer, we could call it, with molten metals, the molten metal and the dross floating on the top in the crucible, they have different emissivities. So for molten metal, your typical IR sensors aren't that reliable. And that's why I'm going to use this, uh, this thermal couple. Okay, so we have a new camera angle, so I think we're ready to pour our aluminum.
so far so good. No calls to 911. We have our molten aluminum here. It's cooling down. Remember the first law of thermodynamics. The first law is don't touch hot things. The aluminum is hot, so we won't touch it. Uh, you can see some of the excess aluminum here. Uh, that will just be remelted. Uh, I was very happy I didn't get any molten aluminum on the wood. In the past, I've had burn marks on my uh, coping drags. And it's important that whenever you're melting metal, not to leave any excess metal in the crucible. That's why I had this ingot tray here that I filled up with the excess aluminum that could be remelted later on. Okay, so now is sort of the, the moment of truth. We're going to open it up and we're going to look at our casting. Here are the uh, ingots that we created. Okay, these will just be melted down later on. Uh, the crucible. Okay, looks like it's in pretty good shape. Let me open up the flask. Pull out the pins. Open it up. And there you could see our cast part. Okay. What I like to do, you could see that, you know, some of the uh, sand uh, is burned. Okay, now, sometimes you can just, you know, keep that mixed in with your sand and later there's something called a mixing or a mulling process. But I like to dig that out a little bit and, you know, throw away the burnt sand. And here is our uh, C-clamp. So I'm going to take out some of the burnt sand. Looks very nice. So I'm going to remove this burnt sand. So I'm going to put them back together and start to dig some of the sand out of the top. Again, the reason I'm doing this is just to Try to do my best to separate out the burnt sand. Okay, well I went a little overboard in removing the burnt sand. I want to end up with nice clean sand for my next melt. But this is what we ended up with. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't really look like a C-clamp. But this happens with all sand castings. Here's the part you want. You always have access with your riser and sprue connected with gates. So the next step is to just use a bandsaw and cut the gates, remove the riser and the sprue, and that's aluminum for your next melt. So here's our C-clamp. It looks pretty nice. Now, of course, the end still needs to be drilled and tapped and a threaded rod will go through, but it's pretty nice. Now, note, this melting of aluminum may seem impressive at first, but note that aluminum is one of the easier metals to melt. And that's why humans transitioned from the Stone Age to the Aluminum Age first. And then once we learned how to mine brass and separate the copper, that's when we went into the Copper Age. And then eventually the higher temperature metals, such as iron and steel. So, from a Volkswagen Jetta to a C-clamp, thank you for watching.